Nick. Uh, I am a doctoral student in Asian theater at the University of Hawaii. So if you're wondering why is this guy talking to us, it's because I study classical theater, specifically Japan. Um, and I also do cover contemporary Japanese theater a little bit more. Um, that would be not part of this presentation today. And artistically, I am a director and an actor. And currently, I am an apprentice at the Theater of Yugen, just a couple blocks away from here. Yeah, Yugen! Uh, where we do a lot of Asian. Uh, Fusion work, combining traditional Japanese uh, theater, usually no, with uh, contemporary European scripts or Western literature to create something new and different. So we're sort of working in this Asian American milieu, but in a different, I guess. All right, but what are we here for today? Today we're here to talk about ghosts in Asian American theater and how ghosts are symbolic representation of the Asian immigrant experience. And also we will be talking about horror movies and Asian horror and Asian ghosts, which I know many of you are excited about, which we will be getting to that as well. Uh, but in order to get a better feel for how the Asian horror and ghost genre made popular by films like The Ring and Jewel or The Grudge uh, have been influenced by centuries old traditions and how that's really affecting Asian American theater today, I'd like to start sort of in a reversed fashion. I'm um, going to start by talking about the characteristics of Asian American drama and get some of the boring literary things out of the way so we have a better context to talk about, especially the plays today. Uh, the one that hopefully some of you just saw, Anna and Red Gazebo, and the one hopefully many of you are sticking around to see the Brothers Paranormal. All right, so to begin with, what is Asian American drama? Now, this question is quite contentious, and so what I'm giving here are some characteristics of what we might call Asian American drama. This is not to be an exclusive, exhaustive list of this is theater for Asians. This is some of the things that playwrights especially have developed, and from reading a number of plays and from looking at the history of what we have developed on stage as Asian Americans. So what kinds of themes emerge from this? All right, so uh, the first thing here is uh, as a recognition of Asian and Western cultural influences on Asian American lives. Uh, American theater, in my opinion, in general, can be characterized as a search for identity and a discussion of what it means to be American. Whether we're talking about The Octa Room or Tony Kushner's Angels in America, the interrogation of what it means to be an American has existed in dramatic literature since the founding of the nation. And when tackling this issue of identity, Race plays a central role in a process of what I call navigating the hyphenate, which means recognizing the influence of both ancestral culture and American culture on an individual. Um, we might also call it blank, uh, blank hyphen American drama, but I'll call this navigating the hyphenate to make it sound fancy. The navigation of this hybrid identity is a major component of Asian American theater. In addition, the majority of Asian immigration to America is a recently relative phenomenon, uh, excuse me, relatively recent phenomenon happening in the last 100, 150 years primarily, uh, creating large groups of first, second, third, or in my case, fourth generation Asian Americans, far enough removed from their cultural heritages that it's not the dominating force on daily life, but it's close enough that it remains a prominent influence on who you are. This history leads to both of the next major characteristics which is a presence of multi-generational families on stage and reclaiming or connecting to cultural history. Multi-generational families are of vital importance to the greater themes of the Asian American theater because family is one of the major conduits of culture and it's how we connect and identify ourselves through our parents, through our grandparents, through our great-grandparents going back generations to figure out how has culture come down to me? How has my ancestry come to me? and thus it plays a significant role also in the process of reclaiming cultural history. And this is not to say that in order to reclaim Asian cultural history, we're saying what did our parents, grandparents, etc. do, we have to reject the American part of our identities. But rather, in order to better appreciate what it means to be Asian beyond a superficial level, reconnecting with the cultural past is a necessity. The rediscovering cultural history then is a major element of Asian American drama, because as the temporal distance uh, between generations gets larger and larger, the immediate influence of our, of our history becomes further and further removed, and the strength of that hybrid identity begins to slowly disappear over time as we come, and we become simply American. But what fuels that need then for reconnecting? In my personal experience, that need is driven by an externalized other where people look at you and say, this is who you are because of your parents or things that you have done with your life or uh, 
cultural practices your family had. Like I grew up eating chopsticks and I had a rice cooker at home. Uh, I didn't realize that that wasn't common until I was almost 15. So, but these are the kinds of things that other people like you used to identify, or you yourself can use to identify your otherness from people. And because the process of that plays then very strongly to developing your identity. But that othering is oftentimes racially motivated. And because the process of othering often relies on the appearance and the shape of things and how we expect things to look and function, all minority groups, of course, have been subjected to stereotypes. And this mean, these are used as a means of repression, both politically and culturally, consciously and unconsciously. Um, even if we think this is something funny, this is a joke, when we're using stereotypes in some way, we're playing into this history, into this political repression. And so the final major characteristic of Asian American theater is the deconstruction of Orientalist stereotypes that have defined Asians in America for well over a century now. Something I actually feel Drake Izzy would do quite effectively. I'll talk about that toward the end of the presentation. All right, now I should note that these characteristics are not just Asian American. Anyone talking about immigrant theater in any way can usually use these kinds of things. <coughs> One of the things that I feel is really important here is that this has been a major force and these characteristics are strongly expressed in Asian American theater, more so than other kinds of theater which have different sort of focuses. Okay, so why is this culture, why does this inform the hype? And how is that emerging in today's two plays? And why is it that ghosts are the vehicles for these characteristics? Why ghosts? In order to have a better appreciation of how ghosts work and why we're using them in, this, in these particular scenes, uh, I'd like to look at the place of ghosts in traditional Asian culture first. I think it would be helpful to use Buddhism as sort of a meta narrative to look at the beliefs and philosophies and the spiritual uh, powers of ghosts in traditional Asia. So for those of you who aren't really familiar with the history of Buddhism, it traveled from India through China and then into East and Southeast Asia. And since Buddhism is a much less dogmatic religion than either Christianity or Islam, the cultures that it came into contact with were heavily influenced by Buddhism, but Buddhism in turn was influenced by local culture, folklore, and customs. And so as it adapted to the various locales across Asia, indigenous practices sometimes mixed with, and sometimes just simply came to exist side by side with Buddhist philosophy. And therefore several broad similarities exist across disparate cultures, even if the precise traditions and customs are a little different, or in some cases extremely different and completely alien to one another. But they still have this sort of meta-narrative to help ground them together. One of the results of the, syncreti uh, of the syncretism, excuse me, syncreticism is a pronounced split in the philosophy behind what ghosts are, especially ghosts of dead persons, and incorporeal beings or spirits that were, not once, that were not once living humans. So basically, we're looking at two large categories of things that in English we would usually refer to just as spirits, generally. But they have very different places in East Asian philosophy, especially in the Buddhist way. So we have ghosts of dead people and natural spirits. Spirits of trees, of rocks, of mountains, sometimes of places. It depends, of course, on the culture as to how we define this, but these are two very different categories. Uh, and Buddhist doctrine also helped mold a general Asian view on how ghosts are created. Why are ghosts here? What are they doing? In Buddhism, ghosts are created by emotional attachment to the living world. Basically, they're created by an addiction to being alive. You, have, you are constantly always wanting to experience more, and whether that is love, or it's anger, or it's passion, or a drive for war, or destruction, these attachments keep people in the world after they have died, and so they're unable to escape. And when a soul is unable to transition to the next phase of existence correctly because of these worldly attachments, usually a priest or a monk is able to pray for the spirit to find enlightenment, and frequently using the phrase Namu Amidabu, or some variation thereof, which roughly means uh, Hail Buddha, uh, the, the spirit and find enlightenment can be released from life. The big trick here is that unlike Western ghosts who are out for revenge, Asian ghosts, especially Buddhist ghosts, cannot be satiated. They can't be satisfied. They are addicted to being alive. And much like you wouldn't want to give, you wouldn't want to give a meth addict more meth to make them feel better, you want to get them off of this. This is the same idea with ghosts. You can't give them the emotional experience. You can't give them their revenge because it just makes them want it even more in the future. And then 
I'd never be able to escape. So a priest acts kind of like a therapist and says, all right, you've had enough, it's time to go. Hail your death, thank you. <laughs> uh, now, this is where I'm about to say that vengeful souls of murdered victims hell bent on revenge and ripping off your face don't exist in Asian culture. They're very, very common, and they're very popular in entertainment. Uh, and so it's unsurprising that for both their religious and entertainment value, ghosts and ghost stories have their major source for theater and cinema in Asia. Uh, traditional Asian theater, Ghosts of traditional Asian theater uh, has me, uh, had an enormous impact on the development of horror genre in more ways than one. And so I'd like to take a moment to look at some of these traditional Asian theaters. And since Asian horror as a genre basically originated in Japan, um, I'd like to look at classical Japanese theater as sort of the root of this origin. So to begin with, ghosts serve a dual function as entertainment and religious parable in one breath. This is typified most strongly in the No. How many of you are familiar with No? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, they know basically that the, the idea of No, it's usually about the spirit of a dead person that's disguised as a living person. Somebody comes along and encounters this ghost, and there's a moment of reveal where we realize, oh, we're actually talking to the ghost of the dead, we're talking to the past, this is really creepy. Uh, it was developed first in the 1400s, and it was designed originally to be both spiritual and entertaining. No was popular theater 600 years ago. Um, but ghosts in No function less like ghosts in revenge stories or spooky tales. So they weren't designed to be plays to scare your socks off. They were designed to be plays to get you engaged with more of an existential view of the world. And why do we suffer? How do we suffer? How can I no longer suffer? That was sort of the idea of No. And so they were souls of suffering people uh, who have been trapped between life and death because of their inability to let go of attachments so on and so forth, skipping that time. Dramaturgically, these ghosts tell the stories of their lives and the places they lived and how they died, which are often tragic and full of pent-up emotions and pathos. And they can connect both the characters on stage and the audience to the source of that pathos and frequently employ a moment of doublespeak where a seemingly human character drops their pretense of disguise, reveals that they are a ghost, and pulls the audience into a phantasmal moment creating a liminal space where truth and reality are destroyed. Everything that was once objective becomes subjective. And it's a scary place to be. That's where fear originates. You know. Suddenly you have to question what is real, what is true. I don't know anymore. This is really weird. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, this then plays into another common culture, or excuse me, a common trait in traditional Asian theater, where causality is sometimes only hinted at, if even at all. Things just happen for sometimes no reason, it seems. And it's up to us, then, to interpret why this is going on, what is really happening here. And stories, then, are often left completely open-ended. A uh, sort of resolution might be, might be achieved where the ghost goes away for the day, but there's no guarantee it's not coming back tomorrow. And it's in my opinion that this reflects an intrinsically Buddhist viewpoint, where existence is encompassed by cyclical, rather than linear motion, like it is in Western theatrical development. Nothing really ends. And this openness is very pronounced in No. However, by the 1600s, No had become about ceremony and elitist fulfillment rather than popular entertainment. In fact, there are journals from the 1600s and 1700s of aristocrats saying that they're going to punish their children by taking them to No and making them watch this. <laughs> I should tell you about how far down in 200 years this kind of theater is. <laughs> um, not to say that No cannot be enjoyable now. I must defend you again here at every turn. We do know, I love No, it can be a beautiful means of expression. But it's not normally the kind of thing that most people will go and seek out for, oh, we're going to see cheap thrill tonight. That got replaced instead by Kabuki. Kabuki is the spectacle hybrid monster that dominated Japanese theater for basically 300 years. Um, and right up until World War II, Kabuki was the dominant form of theater in Japan. It was highly popular. People loved it. But one particular play, instead of talking about, oh, Kabuki is this, Kabuki is that, I'd like to focus just on one play from the repertoire which I think is very, very telling and relatable for this discussion. This play is called Yotsuya Kaidan, or The Ghosts of Yotsuya. It was originally staged in 1825 and tells the story of a woman, Oiwa, who becomes a vengeful ghost. Sound familiar already? This particular story is, is a dramatization that combines two real-life grisly murders with a well-known tradition of ghost stories in Japan that dates back to the 1700s and creates a spectacular revenge ghost play. The events of this particular play are one of the things that make it so famous. So, in summary, because I'm assuming most people don't know the story of the ghost of Yotsuya, so 
Uh, Oliwa is a woman who is poisoned by a jealous rival. This poison mutates her face and causes her, fa her hair to fall out in bloody clumps. As we can see here over on, the, uh, on my left, uh, the actor puts on a prosthetic which deforms their face and looks like their eye is sagging. And as the actor is combing his hair in the scene, the hair it comes out of the wig. Um, and so uh, an stagehand is sitting under the stage, pushing extra hair up through the floorboards to make it look like her hair is piling larger and larger. She goes more and more frantic, and blood starts to drip from her hair and form bloody piles of this It's one of the most spectacular scenes in her life. It's a spectacular scene. What's one of the things that makes it extremely famous? The story continues. Oliwa's husband, disgusted now with the sight of her, hires someone to rape her so that he can, he can divorce her for adultery because uh, classical Buddhism is not very kind to women. I'm not really honest about this. Um, but the mercenary, instead of taking, instead of killing Lila, takes pity on her because of her horrific appearance, and instead shows her her own reflection so she can understand why her husband would want her to meet such a tragic fate. Oliwa flies into a terrible rage and accidentally trips and cuts her throat on the sword that the mercenary is carrying. She bleeds out on the floor, cursing her husband to his final days. And the husband, realizing that now he's going to be guilty of the murder of his wife, decides to take her body and nail it to a door, then nails a servant to the other side of the door and throws both of them into a river, hoping that when their bodies are found, he can claim that she was being unfaithful with the servant and thus, as her husband, it was his right to murder both of them and desecrate bodies. Uh, but Oiwa, having been killed full of rage and hatred, returns as a vengeful ghost, tormenting her husband into killing several people, including her rival and her entire family. And after her husband flees because he realizes being tormented by the ghost, he finds the door floating down the river, and he pulls it out to the bank with the body still yelling on it, and the bodies return to life to have one last go at cursing the husband. And this is only the midpoint of Act 3 in a five-act play. <laughs> this play is very, very long. There are many more uh, events and cra crazy spectacles, but I'm not really going to focus on those, because these two events are really what make Yotsuya Kaidan so famous. The play was a smash success that not only captured the anxieties of the, of the early 19th century in Japan, but has lent itself to numerous interpretations that have allowed it to endure the present. It is one of the only kabuki plays that has been regularly performed since it was written in very other few plays can make this claim. Uh, it's still one of the most popular plays in the rep in repertoire today, due to both the story and, of course, the special effects, which I've sort of described. Uh, Kabuki theater was at such a stage of sophistication by the 19th century that elaborate effects, like the, the bloody hair being pushed up through the floorboards, had been created, which occurs in Act Two. But it's really the husband finding the door with the bodies on it that creates one of the most virtuoso performances in all of Kabuki. Um, the, which it's kind of amazing. In Kabuki, all the actors are played, or all the roles are played by men. So even the female characters are male actors. This is the standard tradition. And so over on the right hand side of the screen, this is where the husband finds the bodies. So this is Oiwa nailed to the door. What's amazing though is that he covers it real quickly with a, with a rug and then flips the door over, and the same actor is playing the murdered servant on the other side of the door. So the actor playing Oiwa is having to do a sudden costume change three or four seconds, portray the other character, flip the door back around, switch back into Oiwa, and then continue to play. Uh, so these kinds of things made this play just spectacularly popular, because these are special effects unrivaled by other plays at the time. Unsurprisingly, this play has been adapted for both film and television, starting as early as 1912, and as most recently as 2006, making it highly popular and widely known for the story in Japan. And these adaptations all preserve the gruesome and horrific qualities of the 1825 script. This particular design for Oliwa's makeup is used in every film adaptation of this story. <laughs> the combination of brutality, violence, terror, and spectacle are all hallmarks of the Asian horror genre. Just from looking at the makeup, it's easy to see a direct connection between Yotsuya Kaiwan and the seminal J-horror film, The Ring. You can already see a prototype of Sadako here with her hair, with her long hair and her creepy face. It's a natural evolution from one to the other. Uh, the modern archetype of the creepy Asian ghost girl is heavily informed by these traditions, and Kabuki set the expectation that her performance could be both spectacular and terrifying, and smashed together with the phantasmal, unexplainable nature of no, the stage is set for an unstoppable horror tradition in modern Japan. Uh, the comparison between Yosuke Kaida and the modern Japanese horror film doesn't really need to be explained. But in the ring in particular, I find a few other fascinating vestiges of note, things that have sort of trickled down in the centuries. 
The story, how many of you have seen The Ring or are familiar with the story of The Ring? Oh, very few. Okay. Uh, the Ring is basically the story of a murdered young girl uh, who is, whose body is thrown down a well. And her spirit manages to create a sort of supernatural videotape, an old VHS. Anybody who watches the videotape receives a creepy phone call saying that in seven days they are going to die. And at the end of seven days, her ghost crawls out of your television screen and terrifies you to death. <laughs> basic plot of the ring. But the protagonist discovers that, uh, that the girl can be stopped if the person who views the video makes a copy of the tape and shows it to someone else. <laughs> and basically what this is, is you're sharing the ghost story long enough to get her off your back for a moment, much as listening to and interacting with some of the very powerful spirits and no play is enough to ameliorate that for the moment. They actually have a striking similarity in how you can deal with ghosts just by acting as a therapist. Nirvana is not achieved. You do not escape the cycle of life and death. But in both cases, the story is bloody. When it ended, the audience can continue to reflect on it just as they would a no play. Another study that I think Asian horror takes from no is the idea that something is just not right. You can't always quite put your finger on it. Something is strange. Something is weird. And from the central figure in a no play, whether he or she walks oddly, or refers to him or herself in the third person, or if you encounter them and suddenly it's night when it used to be day, or a storm comes out of nowhere, something is just off, and the other characters on stage can sense that, and so can the audience. So this, the, the phantasmal moment, when the spirit reveals who they really are, uh, creates a parallel then into this, this liminal world. Excuse me. Uh, there's a parallel then uh, with the treatment of the horror movies where impossible and horrific sounds, like the sound of a boy yowling like a cat, which was made famous by the movie Grudge, or the terrifying, or by, the terrifying bodies, like a little girl crawling before disjointed and mangled limbs like a ring, uh, makes the familiar strange. It makes, it's completely disorienting because you don't really know what to make of this anymore. Suddenly reality isn't real. This abnormality may be expressed in a different fashion of the film, usually being much more cinematic, of course, but strikes the same disorienting core stage connection. All right, so then why is J-Horror so successful in the rest of Asia? I believe it's for similar ghosts, uh, because similar ghosts to traditions are linked together through this Buddhist meta narrative that I already talked about. For example, when we look at Korea, dating back to the time of the Three Kingdoms, which is way back in antiquity, there was a doll, called, a doll, excuse me, called a Sapsari, that was used by generals to chase away spirits, human and other, in a shamanistic fashion. Another famous Korean ghost tale concerns a young woman named Aram, who was killed while defending herself from a rapist. Her ghost successfully punishes the magistrates who would uh, successfully punishes magistrates who come to power but will not investigate her death until finally someone does. Until finally someone does, and after trial, a temple was built to venerate her. A temple which still stands in Korea today. Actually, it's a very popular story. And Aram is a typical example. Uh, you know, forgive me, my brain is not good. Um, as a typical example of what's called a glishin, or literally the spirit of a dead person, which in Korean folklore is contrasted by a yuryo, or an immaterial spirit. So it goes this idea of ghosts are dealt with in Buddhism. Uh, late native religion deals with spirits, more shamanistic sense. And in fact, Aram is, a is the prototype of the stereotypical modern Korean ghost, which, by most accounts, is a young girl dressed in all in white long black hair, who haunts places of great psychic trauma, like the location of a suicide or murder, and frequently looks like one of these images here. <laughs> uh, and as you can see here, again, similarities with Ohiwa, and the girl from the ring looks exactly like this. This is the same thing you can see here. <clears throat> Thailand. So Thailand, we're well, looking at Thailand because of Brothers Paranormal, we want to talk a little more about some of the Thai uh, influences in the play. Thailand is interesting because while it's a predominantly Buddhist nation, uh, folk customs have remained an integral part of Thai beliefs, and a plethora of ghosts and spirits exist to haunt the Thai. Uh, they haunt houses and uh, houses and cemeteries, and also trees. Interestingly enough, um, and most of these terms, spirits, fall under the term P, which usually just means a ghost, but they can take on a wide range of forms. And again, I am not an expert in Thai culture, so from what I understand, uh, these spirits are. They're usually spirits of the dead, but they're also sort of natural spirits, especially when we're talking about trees. You have to correct me if I'm wrong here on this one. Um, but it makes for an interesting mix of both the ghosts of the departed and natural spirits. 
Of these, many spirits are uniquely Thai, but some also have minor cultural roots. Uh, for example, the Preta or Peta are associated with Buddhist beings called hungry ghosts that were greedy or voracious people in life, but after death, their attachment to greed and to consumption is so strong that they return as ghosts with swollen bellies and eternally insatiable appetites, but constricted throats that no, so no matter how much they try to eat, they can never be satisfied because nothing ever reaches their son, and their hunger only grows in death. These are pictures of Peta, or Prita, uh, Prata, excuse me, from Thailand. Uh, you can see the long, starving tongue and the tiny necks and the huge, the distended belly, especially in the female figure. Uh, they, and these, these preta are found in every other culture, especially in Japan. This is a very popular thing for no place to dramatize. And another kind of universal spirit found in Thailand is called Pi Thai Hong, or uh, it's the same kind of spirit that is found across Asia and represented in the ring. And it's usually that vengeful ghost, the scary ghost, that spirit is restless and has suffered a violent or cruel death. On the other end of the Thai spectrum, the uniquely Thai story, is the story about a woman named Mai Nok. Nok was a beautiful woman who died during childhood while her husband was away at war. And when he returned home, he found his wife and child waiting for him. And all those who mourned him, these were ghosts of people who had died, disappeared or mysteriously murdered. One day, the husband learns the truth about his ghostly wife and child and flees in the middle of the night. And Nok flies into a rage attacking her neighbors, accusing them of having driven off her husband. But eventually, she's bound to an earthen jar by a powerful monk, a variation of an exorcist practice that's found in other countries, such as China, as well. She is venerated for her loving devotion to her husband in the, in the modern day, and people make regular offerings to her in a temple that still stands in her memory in Bangkok. So she is a widely popular Thai story. Everyone, apparently, in Thailand knows the story. OK. This is, a picture, this is a picture of the shrine of my God. These are various representations of her and dresses or other goods that are given to her to pray for um, easy childbirth or for the devotion. Okay, so uh, and again, I've already talked a little bit here about the ghosts in modern Asia, so we get some of these returning figures, uh, like the ring, open-endedness, and its connection to Kabuki. This is a picture from the movie The Ring itself. Notice the similarities, again, between the Korea and uh, Kabuki and this girl, Sonic. She crawls here in the lower left-hand corner, crawls out of the TV to kill someone. All right. So with all this in mind, let's go and take a look at a few plays for today, Hannah and the Dread Gazebo and Brothers Paranormal. How does an understanding of Asian horror movies, Buddhist folklore, and classic theater inform a reading of the contemporary Asian American theater work? For those of you who are planning on seeing Brothers Paranormal that haven't already, uh, I'm going to be probably giving away a little bit of the plot. No, no, no. 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 Can't. That's, that's why I was figuring I was going to do A lot of stuff is going to be cut here, so we're going to be. So I realized that most of you probably haven't seen or read this as I was saying. So. Spoilers, unfortunately. Uh, I will do my best to not give anything away. Uh, mostly by focusing on Hannah the Red Museum. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> duality in the process of othering. Ghosts in both of these plays are used to establish otherness, and that emphasizes the need to navigate a multicultural identity within the American mainstream. Like the immigrants of these plays and their descendants, ghosts are things which don't belong, but linger because they don't have a place to be. Uh, near the top of Athlon C3 and Brothers Paranormal, uh, Felix took quotes, one of the characters, quotes an article speculating about a rise in Asian ghost sightings in the U.S. Uh, the article attributes it to the rise of popular Asian horror movies. But through the metaphysical lens of the immigrant, perhaps there could be more reasons why are we seeing more Asian ghosts in America? Why is this a part of this play? Uh, and perhaps the reason is that because Asian ghosts don't have anywhere else to go. Mm -hmm. they, they are completely out of context, just like the immigrants that they represent. Ghosts are always seen as the other because they're not part of the living, therefore not one of us. And Asian ghosts are further step removed in America because Asians are an additional other. So not only are they not living, they're also not American. They have nowhere to go. How do they fit into this context? Um, and it's interesting then to see who sees ghosts, who doesn't see ghosts, how these ghosts get represented in Brothers Paranormal. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip that next part there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, when you're watching the play, if you're watching it this afternoon, pay attention to who looks at the ghosts, who can see them and who can't. Because this is, I think this is informed very heavily by uh, the relationships of people in America, immigrant communities to native communities, 
to especially African American communities, and how the, our histories are very are quite divergent, but lead to the same question: Who is what? Who is us? Who is not? Um, all right. This process is inverted in Dred Gazebo. Uh, the mother in Dred Gazebo was transplanted from her, country, from her old country to a new one, where she finally found a way to identify herself with a new world through home, the, the home gardening channel and through her attachment to curb appeal and things like this. But suddenly she finds that she has to return to Korea to take care of her mother and is forced to confront this identity that she has sort of been giving up. The mother is now a foreign other in her home country, longing for the American mainstream and desperately hanging on anything like the trellis to retain her new identity as an American. It's only after she, ha uh, she has her own ghostly out-of-body experience where she encounters mythological beings, possibly the spirit of her mother, possibly not, possibly Kim Jong-il, possibly not, and melds with the greater mythological past of Korea that she is able to return or start the process of returning to a complete whole. And it's her otherness that turns her journey into one like the, like the Asian ghosts on the West Coast soil. Ghosts in both these plays guide the living through this other territory to negotiate the Asian American hybrid identity. Max needs to be reminded of who he is, the, character, what, the, the main character from Brothers Paranormal. Um, and he is fed his cultural past. Hannah and her family, on the other hand, basically need to remind them that they're Asian because they are constantly being confronted with throughout the play. But they're stuck trying to fully grasp what that might mean in light of the incomprehensible circumstances surrounding uh, Hannah's grandmother's suicide and their sudden relocation to Korea. Korea is not America, America is not Korea. So where do they belong? How do they fit into these worlds? And the answer to that, uh, the answer that these ghostly guides establish is a legacy of generations. Uh, the multi generational aspect takes on new dimensions in Dread Gazebo by linking the death of the ghosts of the recent dead with the spirits of the nation's past and placing the demilitarized zone in a liminal space with unlimited potential for enlightenment, much as you would find in an open. The line of ascension from tiger mom to grandmother to mother to daughter is a pathway for transmission of myth and legend. And the temporal distance, all right, we're skipping it, it's about brother's paranormal. Never mind, all right. <laughs> Suffice to say that in brother's paranormal, there is a collision of the past and present in that play. And look for that, how that might be then influenced by this understanding of Buddhism and spirits of the past coming back to us. Uh, and this is where things really diverge quite heavily between these two plays. All right, so looking largely at, here we go. Uh, Hannah and the Dread Gazebo in the process of playing, reclaiming cultural history. Uh, the ghosts, let's see, and these two plays represent different metaphysical states of being. The ghosts in Dread Gazebo are just souls of the dead. This play is filled with mythological spirits and creates the space where the ghost-spirit dichotomy is deconstructed and the, two elements upon, uh, and the two elements open up a world where history and myth meld and are made concrete and are made real. This liminal space also stretches beyond singular culture and establishes the amalgamated culture that the living characters inhabit. In this way, ghosts are used much more like they would be in No. In part three, scene 11, there's a number of wonderful images that I just love from Hannah from Dread Gazebo that demonstrates this construction of liminal space. First off, the tiger grandmother is there. The reference to the stereotypical roaring, threatening Asian tiger mom is probably quite immediately obvious to many of us, especially those of us that have grown up with Asian American families. This, uh, that image was very striking, it was hard to miss. Um, but the boundaries between ghost and spirit are challenged with the same actor playing both the, grand, the tiger grandmother and the grandmother forcing these two different kinds of spirits, sort of the naturalistic spirit and the spirit of the dead, into a single physical body, and bridging the dead and, the and bringing the dead and the mythological together, and turning it into a conduit for greater spiritual truth. Then, an added reference that the that tiger grandmother, dressed in the grandmother's slippers, has just actually eaten, has probably eaten the actual grandmother from the play, adds another cultural layer on the scene, because you can't have a talking wild animal dressed like an old lady threatening to eat someone's grandmother without immediately evoking a little red riding hood in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm sorry, just really, it's, it's kind of difficult to avoid that. Which makes this even uh, this whole moment even more bizarre and even less usual. Uh, and so suddenly, this is not just a ghost play, and this isn't just an immigrant story. It's the retelling of a classic European fable as well, and boundaries between culture, past, present, future, and uh, individual identity have been completely destroyed we are left with nothing but an open liminal space where identity and reality are completely fluid. 
All that is, uh, this is all brought together by the little stone in the bottle that Hannah has inherited from her grandmother. Whatever the stone in the bottle really is, whether it is actually the remains of the bear spirit from antiquity, or if it's just a pebble made from around the stuff in a vial, and thought, hey, this is really cool, uh, by virtue of the spirit journey in this play, it makes the mythological real. It doesn't matter anymore. Mythology has been made concrete in this stone. And that makes the object, it truly makes it then, a heart's wish, the heart's wish of the ancient bear. And this process of making the mythological real opens up another important uh, Asian American element in Dread Gazebo, which is the deconstruction of identity based on stereotype. Uh, Dang is actually my favorite example from the play. And when at the top of part two, he starts talking about uh, he starts talking about being in Korea for the first time in his conscious memory, and how it's messing with the perception of who he is, because he's so used to seeing everyone not looking like him that he's kind of based his identity on not looking like everybody else. And so suddenly, everybody looks just like him. Well, God, what does this mean? Who am I? What's going on? Uh, and it, every part of him screams out that he doesn't belong. And he finds that he is almost completely unable to tell one person from another as the constant writing jokes with the man with garlic and the other girl are always indicating. Is that really show? Are you really a different person? Can't actually tell. And as the girl says, just because you're Asian, it's because you're not racist. Uh, but because of his understanding of what it means to be Korean, it's built around his physical stereotypes. And so this play deconstructs those stereotypes. And it's through the channel of the man with garlic that Dang is able to really deconstruct these images of himself and the, the, the identity he's formed for himself. This unusual old man becomes Dang's doorway to the past as he provides a conduit for Dang to connect with his Korean heritage and to begin to understand it on a much deeper metaphysical level. Uh, even though Dang doesn't speak Korean, however, or somehow, when the old man starts to speak to him in the subway train, he understands the myth that he's being told. He understands it on some very personal, very deep level of how Korea was created and how he was created. And like the 100% hearts level wish that Hannah receives, Dang is get eventually given a token of this past connection, that piece of garlic that he received from the old man eventually. Both Dang and his sister have now been given parts of mythology made concrete, and thus they can begin to come to a new understanding of what it means to be Asian American. And like, and like the Amish gazebo on the rooftop of the apartment building in South Korea, Hannah and her family may never fit perfectly into the surrounding environment, but through the ghosts of the past and the specters of the world that they inhabit, they're able to still find a place to be. I think I'm going to go ahead and end it. <laughs> women and their jealousy and their attachments and their trivial things. And so I think that plays very strongly into why women even to this day in East Asian cultures have, they're fighting an uphill battle. Feminism in Asia is a very, very steep hill that people are still trying to overcome. And I think the ghosts that represent that philosophy brought to, brought to life in modern age. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. Okay. Anything else? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah uh, of the, I, I I saw the film, the Thai film, Mang Na. Uh, I guess about 10, 15 oh. or so years ago. That was that was made on that legend we were talking about. I was wondering how faithful are modern interpretations. I mean, obviously the ghost stories are, you know, the modern ghost stories are variations, but the ones that try to tell a traditional story help. How accurate do they tend to stay to those kinds of uh, Actually, Chris, I have a question for you. What's your stance on that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know that there have been dozens and dozens of adaptations of that particular legend, so, so I think there are sort of variations on, on whatever the quote unquote truth is. I mean, in terms of like the, the legend, I mean, I don't even know that we could even claim the legend was being pure truth. So, so yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
not entirely sure, but there, yeah. there are many variations of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is trivial, but I'm yeah. curious, yeah. and this made me more curious, what's the significance of the garlic as the sustenance that they're yeah, given in, in Korean? I wish I knew the answer to that. That's an excellent question for you. Is it not here? Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone else have any ideas? As well, to well, yes. well, I just, you know, I remember when I first went to Korea many years ago and I was told, well, you know, you think Italians eat so much garlic. Well, they eat 13 pounds per person per year. Koreans use 26 pounds per person per year. So it's such a, it's such a basic food. I'm just thinking it's a, it's a basic essential food. And it does ward off evil spirits. Yeah. Ah. So we know that in many cultures. That's true. That was very true. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This is actually more of a Western thing with the garlic, but uh, I once heard that the, the resulting in the like the uh, why th this whole thing about vampires, for instance, why they're warded off by garlic, was because they're dead bodies, and garlic was used to cover up the smell of dead bodies. So you'd be smelling garlic instead of dead rotting flesh. So maybe, I don't know, maybe that has something to do with it. I don't know. It's not my memory. Yeah, in fact, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so with regards to the personalities of the ghosts, the female ghosts in particular, mm -hmm. um, in the various cultures you've mentioned, I wonder, is there generally a distinct shift in the personality of the goat, like the being that is the ghost, in life versus death. Um, because they're so, some of them seem so, so sinister. Is it like they've always been like that, or is it very much a, like are they like, all of a sudden opened up to that possibility after death? That's a really interesting question. Um, I think when we're looking at, especially traditional storytelling, uh, women are transformed, if we're talking about the female ghost, uh, actually any ghost in this case, a ghost is transformed by whatever emotion it is most strongly attached to. The reason they can't move on is because their entire existence has been replaced by that emotion. So in the case of most of the female ghosts, women were assumed to be either jealous or vengeful. That was the characteristic standard they assigned to them. And so it was always assumed that either jealousy or rage always consumed their whole existence. So they were definitely usually not like that as women in life, but they become that as women in death. Um, to more or less of a certain degree. Sometimes it's like there's a story about a woman who it's very obvious that she was destined for this fate, sort of like to explain how women are like this anyway, so it's very sexist. But um, sometimes that is the case, but in most cases, no. People are completely transformed by whatever they were attached to. Thank you. Yes? Yeah, um, is there something unique about Japanese ghosts? I remember the Japanese Film Festival about, all about ghost stories mm -hmm. and how they, there were a lot of foxes, firefox. Yeah, yes, foxes. There's specific kinds of ghosts unique. I didn't go into that here, but every East Asian culture has a giant plethora of different kinds of spirits. Um, fox spirits are actually not completely unique to Japan. Uh, they're shared across many East Asian cultures, but foxes are usually shapeshifters and tricksters, and they're known as, known as beings of great magic and mystic power. Um, why they're always tricksters, I'm not entirely positive. But that is that is a common thing for foxes. So yeah, that's just one example of many other kinds of spirits that do exist out there. And the fox spirits are an example of things of a natural spirit. They were not a person who died and became Right, so they're not vengeful or anything like that. They're yeah, no, not vengeful. Some people. Yeah, yeah, they're just usually out to make people's lives difficult. That's what they're to. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm direct. I, yes. I, I'm directing Princess Play, which I'm decisively not an expert on Asian ghosts. Well, ghosts, Asian or otherwise. But I've had to watch quite a few Thai horror movies as well as for this play, which was I don't like them, which is <laughs> selflessness. Um, but um, the thing that became really clear fairly quickly, um, at least in the kind of vengeful female ghost movies that I was focusing on, they also had children. There's like another version that's all about children ghosts. Mm -hmm. Children. Yeah. Anyway. Um, but the, the, it usually seems like, at least in the modern retellings or the modern stories, the, defin the way the ghost is in death is really defined more so by the um, nature of their death. So what happened to them when they died, you know, how they died, 
and usually it involves an unjust or painful or you know whether it be rape or murder or you know etc. Um, they get that term. It seems like that's the thing they carry and that's the thing they're trying to avenge. Um, so it doesn't seem like it really always carries to how they are in life, but it's how they are in the moment of their death, what they experience. Mm -hmm. um, yes. That's what I would say from my very limited. Yeah, <laughs> I absolutely agree. Yeah. Could you provide like just a quick overview? What are what are male ghosts like? Male ghosts, mm -hmm. or Asian folklore. Would, would male ghosts go after somebody they felt cheated them, for example? Yes. Other males. Uh, male ghosts. Okay. So if we're looking at, uh, I'm going to go back to no characters. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of male ghosts. You know, uh, many of them were warriors. They were men who were cut down in the prime of their lives and were very. Either they don't realize the world is going on because they were so focused on battle, they don't realize the battle is over, and that what they're doing is they're fighting a battle for hundreds of years that they have no place in anymore because it's gone. Or they can be um, uh, murder victims, again, people who are out for revenge, or someone who has been uh, cut down for not necessarily the prime of their life, but uh, there's a very famous play about a guy who drowns himself because a girl is being spiteful towards him. And she tricks him into believing that he's that she's in love with him. And when it comes out that he's not, he throws himself in a little river and a little pond and drowns himself. And he comes back for the sole purpose of making this woman's life dead. Um, that's all he does. And he, he threatens her. He says that she's going to be old and ugly. And he starts cursing her with these things like the infirmities of age. Um, because he himself was an old man who was who had been tricked. So there are other kinds of ghosts as well. Um, I'm trying to think of other really good examples at the moment, but they're never coming to me. But so there are. They, they do exist. Does that help at all? Yeah, I just want you to know, like, so like women ghosts are supposed to be vengeful and overly attached to the world. I just want to know like what are male ghosts. Like, you know, so uh, usually pretty angry. Male yeah. ghosts are actually angry at, their, at the circumstances of their death. Um, and instead of being uh, vengeful completely, they're more about, um, they, they, it's like trying to get out, but they can't because the only way they know how to get out is to fight. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Atsumori? Atsumori, yeah. Uh, again, it's the story of a young boy who was cut down in battle. He doesn't realize that his life, that the world is going on without him, essentially, is how the character is to be. But it's a no play about a very famous um, aristocratic young man who was very talented, who was very artistic, who was very genteel, wrote poetry, and he was a real badass on the battlefield. People really respected him. Um, he was killed at 16 when, by a much older general of, of, an or of a rival army. Um, and his ghost was never able to move on because he was so upset at having died and left. Yeah, um, I'm sorry I, didn't, I missed some parts of this, so I don't know if you talked at all about um, spirit houses. No, I did not, actually. Um, you mentioned them. You mentioned the peak, the house was in that, Oh, um, that was from what I had found, was that the ghosts, in, uh, uh, ghosts haunt houses. Like, houses are a place where you, uh, abandoned houses especially, places you can find ghosts. Is that what you're talking about? You're talking no, about, no, 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 yeah, which is a completely separate thing, and I'm not actually too knowledgeable about spirit. Well, the reason I ask that is because for two of the plays, at least that I know of, there are discussions about that. Um, in just in the dramaturgical discussions mm -hmm. of the plays, the idea that a spirit has a place to go back to uh, when they visit the, uh, their relatives or their families. Oh, I'm curious, what else was said? Well, I mean, uh, do you know that's... Tell us about spirit houses. If you are you referring to the kind of the little yeah. tiny where you leave houses? food for them? Oh, they're little like altars that you yeah. put in the hall. But they're no, they're also. Um, I did some research on them because we discussed this, and they often are um, outside yeah, right. in their yards. Right. And um, they're places where they go to find their loved ones. Yeah. 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 Ye
fifteen dollars in Chinatown, yeah. sort of like very Americanized, and you know it had little red candles that you plugged in and they glowed. You know it was um, super super cheesy, and that was actually purposeful. Um, so I can't say that has a lot of roots in. No, but the, the, it's still it's necessarily I mean, it's an Asian American play, and it's yeah. a it's a actual multi hyphenate play, mm -hmm. right? It's not just even Asian. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the way we used that one was uh, the house, sort of like what you're saying, was a way for the sister to communicate with her dead brother, so to be able to send things to him. Um, she was going through this super Americanized, super cheesy Chinese-looking red candles. Um, but it, like, it functioned like a, like a video game interface, so she yeah. put something in it and it would download to the game, to, to the level of the game where he was in, in the afterlife. <coughs> What's the name of that, Aaron? I didn't hear. Before Tan Gone. That it was the play that was in this space before. Yeah. I guess another question about um, the inevitability of ghost experience. Oh uh, yeah. Because it seems like well, right now Obon is starting. So the Japanese tradition of like when the ancestors come back to your house, <laughs> they're supposed to come back. Right. And. Right. Um, so, and you're supposed to be there to say hello and, and give them a party, <laughs> like in um, Day of the Dead. I'm just wondering, like, is this it's inevitability of ghosts, you're supposed to come back. Do you find that predominant in age American theater that we're, you know, it's just ghosts, you're supposed to live with ghosts. Understand the question correctly. Um, so, the question, so the question is: uh, For Asian American theater, are we just is the expectation we just have to live with ghosts, or yeah. is that we are expecting them to come back all the time? Either or. Either or. Okay. Uh -huh. uh, I think because of the way that ghosts are used in Asian American drama, um, that there is an expectation we are always living amongst the ghosts of those who come before us. I really think it's that we're expecting them to sort of cyclically return, but that they are always present. They're always in our lives, and they're always informing who we are. Whether we recognize that at any given moment or not is, is a sort of question, but they are always present in our lives. It doesn't have to be ghosts. Ancest no. Ancestors. Absolutely not. And this is where it gets really tricky. I think this whole idea of uh, ghosts of dead persons versus spirits, it gets really uh, mushy, I guess, when you start really talking about the deep philosophical meanings of it, because once a person has died and they've escaped sort of life and death, um, they're, depending on which local customs you've been heavily informed by, which country you're living in, uh, it, it can be things like, we're to, when we talk about ghosts of living people or um, ghosts of the dead, we're really talking about hauntings, things, places that are haunted by spirits that never leave. But if we're talking about ancestor spirits of people who have died and didn't really have strong lingering attachment to the world, these become more like spirits in the animistic sense. They're not really the ghosts of dead people so much anymore in the same way. Um, there's so much different philosophy to connect this. It's hard to, to draw broad gen um, to draw generalities about this. But yeah, the, it's absolutely true that the ancestors are sort of always with us, and they're not really ghosts in the same fashion. But they don't want to get a meal. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess. wanted to talk about that house, um, Chinese house that um, we just talked about, because I'm from Hong Kong and from definitely from Chinese culture. Actually, that thing, instead of putting in the yard, most of us will put inside our yeah. house. Because we believe that people die and their spirit or their soul will only float in the air. So that putting it, giving them a house is for their resting. For their comfort. Yeah, for their comfort. And that red candles or something is actually their food. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, I, I, the, the ones that I did research on were Thai, I think specifically, and those were exterior. So it's interesting, I mean, it's the similar idea, and you're saying informed by local culture mm -hmm. or specific culture really just change. And the reason that we did that is we were talking about what the gazebo was. Yeah. <laughs> we were wondering what yeah. it was, you know, and it was an interesting way to explore that idea. That's a really interesting point. I had to go through this. was fascinating. <laughs> Oh, and there is one more interesting concept. Uh, the longer the candle is, the richer they are. More to feed more people. <laughs> 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 